Uh, so, mm, let's start our uh, uh, today's M seminar, and we are happy to have Miguel Moreira from ETH in Zurich, Verasora constraints for shift moduli spaces via wall crossing, please. Okay. Uh. Yeah, I was going to start by by saying that it's possible that I will freeze sometimes. So let me know when that happens. Uh, um, ah, yeah, big, yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, th th thanks a lot for for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak here. I've watched uh, a few of the the talks in the M seminar on the YouTube channel, so it's nice to to give one myself. So I'm going to talk about there's a constraint for shift moduli spaces. Um, and this is this was a joint work with Arkady Boko and Bonham Lim uh, that can be found on, on the archive here in this link. So I want to start by doing some, some very quick historical introduction of what are there's our constraints in enumerative geometry. Um, and the story of there's our constraints starts with a very celebrated Witten's conjecture. Um, from 1990. Um, so Witten, um, the conjecture is about the moduli space of stable curves MGN bar and about um, the, the, its intersection theory. So there are certain special cohomology classes in this moduli space called psi classes. Um, and you can study how uh, and you can study the, the integrals of those psych, of products of psi classes, and Witten conjectured that um, such integrals should uh, should satisfy some 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 relations. And one way to write these relations is the following: so if you if you put those integrals of psi classes in a generating function z, which is called a partition function, then Witten's conjecture is equivalent to uh, some particular set of differential operators L k annihilating z for k bigger or equal than minus one. And this particular uh, these particular differential operators, they, they define a representation of half of the Verizor algebra. So they satisfy this Verizor bracket. So why it is called Verizor if it's not Verizor? <laughs> well, it's half the Verizor, but uh, actually in some in some cases, it's possible to extend, uh, to extend this um, these operators to, to a full representation of the Verizor algebra, but the rest does not constrain the enumerative geometry. So they don't really um, yeah, have an enumerative meaning, but sometimes you can extend the, ver the, the operators them themselves. And actually I, I will explain in this talk that in, in a certain setting we can do that. Okay. Um, so th this was then, proven by, by Konsevich just a couple of years later. And then there were also some other proofs and this played a, a really important role in the development of, uh, of the subject of Gromovitan theory. Uh, basically, because if you want to calculate anything in Gromovitan theory, uh, MGN bar is, is kind of the, the most, uh, most basic calculation you can do. For example, if you want to compute Gromovitan invariance of of a, a toric variety, you you always reduce those kind of computations to MGN bar, and then Witten's conjecture allows you to compute things in MGN bar. Okay, um, and then this the this this conjecture was extended by Eguchi and Xiong to the gram Witten theory of any target variety. So this is a generalization in the sense that M the, these integrals of psi classes in MGN bar are basically the ground of Witten invariance of the points. Um, so more generally for any target variety, you, you can get some similar type of constraints uh, conjecturally. This is still uh, quite a big open problem in ground of Witten theory. Uh, and except a few cases, most notably uh, curves and uh, toric varieties, this is not proven. So what I want to talk about today is instead um, a, a version, 
version of these conjectures, but for moduli spaces of sheets instead of moduli spaces of st stable maps that appear in Gromovitan theory. And the, the entry point for that is the so-called MNOP conjecture. So this conjecture uh, predicts that the, the Gromovitan invariance of, of a trifold should be uh, directly related to the Donaldson-Thomas invariance of that same trifold. And these Donaldson-Thomas invariants are some kind of some invariants that count uh, ideal shifts on a trifold. So if you if you believe this this correspondence, uh, which which is also conjectural, except in a few cases, including toric varieties, um, then you should expect that there should also be some analog of the Verzora constraints in DT theory. Uh, and indeed, Oblomkov, Okunkov, and Pandere Pandere, they uh, basically at the time of the, the proposal of the MNOP correspondence, they made some, some calculations and, and they, they made some precise prediction for how should be the, the various order constraints on the moduli of uh, ideal sheaves. Okay, but only much more recently, uh, thanks to a lot of uh, advances in understanding of of the correspondence, it was possible to actually prove that the MNOP correspondence intertwines the Verzor operators on the Gromovitan side and on the DT side. Not and even without all the the developments, not it's not possible to prove this fully for now. Only in so-called stationary regime. And what we did, it's it's possible to prove the Verzor constraints for the DT theory of toric trifolds with stationary descent. It's possible to do this for, for toric trifolds because both the various order constraints and the MNOP correspondence are known for toric trifolds. What is stationary descent? So yes. stationary descent just means that um, we do not allow... So in, in Gromovitan theory, the, the, the descendants are basically a, a product of a, a psi class and uh, some class that's pulled back via an evaluation map from X. And basically we ask that the classes that we pull back from X all have degree at least two. Does it, did this make sense? Uh, no, because you're talking about the DT theory. You you do not consider pullbacks. You consider uh, ideal shifts with certain support. So it's, uh, uh, no, what but, do you so call I descendants I, I, I am not familiar with this term okay I, I will I will define descendants in DT theory in a while but maybe uh -huh. an important point that that's worth making now is that here I'm talking about DT theory but this is not necessarily a DT theory of a club tree fault so I, I'm allowing and actually that's what I'm interested in uh moduli spaces with positive virtual dimension. So in that uh, uh, it's not a big deal, but uh, um, the question it's... is, uh, I mean, what, what do you really count? So how how do you count? It's a different question, but what do you count? So that, that this is a question about the stationary. But it's, if you define it later, that's it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I will I will introduce the sentence later. I mean. The enumerative meaning is maybe not, not so clear, but uh, what I call enumerative invariants, uh, like the, the DT invariants are, is basically um, integrals of certain cohomology classes, which I call descendants against virtual fundamental class. But I, I will exactly say what those, uh, what those cohomology classes are in a while. Okay. So then um, we, we use this result for, for uh, I use this result for, for toric trifolds to prove some version of, of the constraints for the Hilbert scheme of points on uh, any simply connected surface. Uh, and basically it used the result for toric surfaces and then some kind of bootstrapping. And uh, after well, this- uh, in, your, in your uh in your result, since it's, we are still in the history part, uh, what do you, what did you count for the Hilbert scheme of points? Uh, so yeah. in the case, 
Yeah. Well, it, it's it's the same. So in this case, there is no virtual fundamental class. The Hilbert scheme of points is just a very nice, smooth, projective variety. And there are some tautological, so some class, cohomological, sorry, some cohomology classes. And I integrate that those cohomology classes against the, the normal fundamental class. Yeah, you consider and what I'm saying projective. is that there are some relations among these integrals. You consider only projective surfaces or because yes, 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 yes. Okay. For example, all this Nakajima business is not like okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So actually that's a kind of an interesting question, but which I'll not address. Uh, but okay. So after after my, my paper, uh Dirk van Brie. Uh, he actually, so he conjectured the generalization of, of this result for Hilbert scheme of points uh, to moduli spaces of higher rank stable shifts on surfaces. So Hilbert scheme of points are basically rank one, rank one. And so he conjectured something for higher rank. And so at, at this point, it, it, it becomes kind of clear that there should be a much more general story uh, behind this. and. That's that's essentially what I'm going to to, to talk about today. So I I want to explain. Very good. I'm still confused. Since you you do not impose this Calabiao condition, so for example, still this Nakajima count of uh, torsion free shifts with framing, but on CP two, it's a surface, it's a smooth surface, it's projective. I'm not sure whether this falls in the class which you considered because stability i mean here it's Giesecker stability but with some additional framing so then this count which nakajima considered in the 90s does it is it a special case um so i, I will in a while i'll define things more concretely and um so the answer is not exactly no uh, at least what I'm going to, to say today, uh, I, I'm not going to consider any kind of framing. I didn't think seriously about it, but I I suspect that it's kind of possible to do a version of this theory for for that that allows framings. But I, I didn't think about it mm. yet, really. Okay. But what I'm going to say today does not apply to those spaces. So I'll say what what spaces I'm I'm thinking about in just just a bit. Mm. So I, I want to explain a unified formulation of Verzor constraints for moduli spaces, for some different families of moduli spaces. Um, I want to explain how these constraints uh, can actually be formulated in an extremely natural way in the vertex algebra language that Dominic Joyce uh, has been um, developing to study wall crossing. And uh, although this might be extremely expectable, uh, from some point of view, because well, Verzor operators come naturally in vertex algebras. Uh, for example, such a connection is not known in Gromfit and theory. Like th there is no uh, vertex algebra that explains the Verzor operators in Gromfit and theory. Um, so, in in a sense, this is uh, a benefit of going to the shift world. And well, the the, the point of uh, Understanding this connection between Verzor constraints and Dominic Joyce uh, vertex algebra is that we more or less automatically uh, can prove that Verzor constraints are compatible with wall crossing in some precise sense. Uh, which you will explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. yeah. Okay. Um, and using this, we can uh, we can prove the Verzor constraints for some particular moduli spaces. For instance, moduli spaces of stable shifts on curves and on surfaces with, with this condition on the Hodge numbers of the surface. <clears throat> and uh, I will, well, I'm not sure I'll have time, but if I do, I, I will give a, at least an idea of how the proof goes. Okay, so let me now say what kind of moduli spaces uh, I'm thinking about. So I will say, I will call a moduli space of sheaves, some moduli space M, which should, uh, of shifts on a smooth projective variety, with the moduli space itself should be um, projective or at least uh, 
list proper. And usually I, I want X to be a small of small dimension. And I will consider moduli, uh, for now I'll consider moduli spaces that have no strictly semi-stable shifts, although I will remove this assumption later. Um, but, but when you say stable, what actually do you mean? You should choose stability structure. Yes, yes, it. sure. So it's that. Do you fix it, or it's some uh, previously known stability structure? I don't know. So, yeah. I mean, imagine you're in a situation and you you have some moduli problem and you have some stability and you get some you get a moduli space M and there are no strictly semi-stable shift for, for ah, this. So, uh, so it can be any stability structure with no 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 strictly semi-stable shifts, something like that. Yeah. And even the strictly semi-stable shifts that uh, as long as Joyce's theory uh, ap applies will also we can also formulate uh, a, a conjecture for for that. Okay, so I will assume that there is some universal shift. And by the way, I will always say shifts, but uh, it, it's also possible that there are, for example, modulized spaces of complexes of perfect complexes. So I will assume that there is a shift and a, a, an important uh, universal shift. And the important point is that this universal shift is typically not unique. Because usually, if, if you have a, a universal shift G, you can tensor it by a line bundle pulled back from the moduli space, and you get a different universal shift. That's related to moduli moduli problems of shifts usually not being uh, fine. And and finally, I will assume that M admits a, a two-term perfect obstruction theory with the usual deformation theory of of shifts. So the tangent space is x one at a shift G is x one of G and G. The obstruction space is x2. And I will assume that all the higher x vanish. So in, in this condition, we have uh, a virtual fundamental class mver in the homology of, of m, uh, we, which is what we're going to use to, to get enumerative invariants. So uh, I will, so, so a, few, a few examples that that are the ones that you should keep in mind because they're main ones that uh, uh, fit the previous description are moduli spaces of stable vector bundles uh, on curves of stable uh, shifts on, on surfaces. And those can be either um, torsion-free torsion -free shifts, so with positive rank, or one-dimensional shifts, so supported on, on, on a curve. And you can also think about the moduli space of ideal shifts or of stable pairs on a, on a trifold. And for for what I'm going to say today, I will ask that it's Fano and I'll ask that PG is positive, but I mean, those things can be, can be removed, but uh, what I'm going to say today that would not apply directly in, in those cases. So let's, let's keep these conditions. Okay, so a, a different flavor of moduli spaces that also plays an important role are moduli spaces of pairs. So on the moduli space of pairs, I will uh, I want to parameterize not only not only a shift but a shift together with a, a map from a fixed shift v. For example, if I take v to be the structure shift, then I, I want to parameterize shifts together with the section. And there are Two, two main differences in, in the way moduli of pairs behave. Uh, and the most fundamental one is that moduli spaces of pairs typically do have a unique universal object, which doesn't have for, for that doesn't happen for moduli of shifts in which there is this ambiguity up to tensoring by, by a line bundle. And also the deformation theory uh, is different because now we can deform not only the shift, but also, but also we can deform the, the map from V to F. So the deformation the theory is given by R ohm of V to F, F. Okay, and a few, a few examples that uh, fit in, in this, this description. Uh, for example, symmetric powers of curves. It's a very simple moduli space. Um, moduli spaces of Joyce Song or more generally Bradloff pairs. And these ones I will talk about more uh, 
later because they they play a role in in the proof in the proofs of uh, the very low constraints in in this case that I talked about. Uh, Grassmannians, which are uh, also a really simple moduli space of, of pairs just over a point, uh, and quad schemes on curves or surfaces. So these are just some examples. And also there are uh, some, some other variations uh, in which there is also some kind of story, but which I, I'm not going to talk about today at all. For example, flag varieties, moduli spaces of quiver representations, moduli spaces of parabolic bundles, and I guess we can we can maybe put here uh, as as the question uh, moduli spaces of sheaves on surfaces with a framing. So yeah, but then there are certainly strictly uh, there are certainly semi-stable sheaves which are not stable for, for quivers with relations. It's obviously. And yeah, so... yeah, but but this is, this is not that big of a deal, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes, but ha having strictly semi-stable sheaves it is not that big of a deal, really. Uh, for for the way I'm going to start by presenting things, it is. But uh, but with the technology that Trice has been developing, it's not really a problem. Uh, well, uh, since I don't know what technology do you mean. But I suspect that there will be a problem. But no, I'll go on. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. We we can talk about that later. Uh, okay. So let me now uh, start by saying some more more concrete things, um, and to really say what 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 are. Uh, the enumerative invariants that we're considering and what exactly are the relation the the Verzoro constraints. So uh, the idea is we're in this setting that we have a virtual we have a moduli space we have a virtual fundamental class, and uh, um, and we want to get enumerative invariants and I I'm focusing on the case that the virtual dimension is positive. So if I want to get uh, numbers out of the virtual fundamental class, I need to integrate something against the virtual fundamental class. And the natural things to, to integrate in moduli spaces of sheaves are, are so-called descendants. So I'll, I'm, I'll start by making this a very, very just a formal definition. I'm defining dx to be uh, just a formal algebra, free supercommutative algebra generated by symbols like this. CHI of gamma, where gamma is some cohomology class of X. Um, and the, the point is that if if I'm if I'm given a, a moduli space of sheaves and I'm given a universal shift, then I can realize these symbols in the in the cohomology of, of my moduli space by by some definition like this. So um so I, the real geometric realization of this symbol CHI gamma with respect to G is, uh, is given as follows. So I, I take my class gamma, I, I, pull it, uh, I pull it back to the product M cross X. Then I multiply by a by some churn character of G. And, and finally, I push everything forward just to the, to the moduli space. So I get some, some cohomology class in my moduli space uh, M. And there is uh, something slightly funny happening here in, in this in, in the index, which is very non-standard, but it's very useful for the various constraints. constraint. So uh, the, in, in the index that I put here is I plus dimension of X minus S, where gamma is a class of Hodge type ST. Okay, so, so this is so that this class is like is like a its Hodge type would be i comma something if m will, would be smooth. Of course, in general, m will not be smooth, so it doesn't have a Hodge decomposition. But uh, still, you should think that this class lives in has. has Hodge type i comma something. I have a funny definition, but it. it it's kind of part of the Verzora story. 
it's kind of part of the Verzora story that, that uh, Hodge degrees do play a role, um, do play a role in the constraints. And by putting a Hodge degree here, I'm I will not have to deal with Hodge degrees from now on. So this is kind of a natural definition just to study the Verzora constraints. Okay, so let me now define uh, the Verzora operators. So the Verzora operators will be operators acting on this algebra dx in the algebra of formal symbol of formal descendants. Um, and these operators have two parts. So they're written as um, a, a derivation Rn plus a linear term Tn. So Rn is a is a derivation and it's because it's a derivation, you just need to define it on generators. And it's defined on the generator CHI gamma by basically increasing this index i to i plus n and multiplying by some combinatorial coefficient. So it's a fairly simple derivation. And uh, Tn is a linear term, so it's multiplication by some, some fixed element in this algebra. And this fixed element has this um, strange expression. So it doesn't really matter the precise form of this, but um, roughly speaking, is it's a sum over the the, the Kunet decomposition of of the diagonal, or more precisely, the Kunet decomposition of the push forward of the top class of x under the diagonal. But the the precise form is not not so important. It's just it's some fixed element in in the in the in the algebra dx. Okay, and again, uh, uh, so, and these ones are, are defined only for n bigger or equal than minus one. So again, they define a representation of half of the virus or algebra. Uh, can said, we realize this uh, a certain kernels on the product, like by like certain correspondences? You, you work with Chern classes, but so it's natural to ask Probably you you will tell that later. It's sharing classes of something. Yeah. You, uh, your definition is purely formal. You have some which, super which, commutative uh, algebra. One? Some uh, this. Uh, just yeah, yeah. This element. is a, this is a purely formal definition. Yeah, yeah. But probably uh, you, these formulas they have some geometric meaning. Yeah, they come from. Uh, mm, some correspondences so churn classes are really churn classes of some whatever i don't know shifts so the so this part is completely formal but uh, the point is that when i have a moduli space and when i have a universal shift i can realize these formal symbols uh, mm -hmm. and this realization is defined in this way so yeah it's it's a kind of correspondence uh, I think the, the churn class of uh, uh, ah, okay. class of the universal sheaf. Yeah, yeah, but uh, this is churn class, but then the, actually the kernel is the universal sheaf. Uh, so because I can go to um, what people like to do to, the, I don't know, derived category of coherent sheaves on, on M cross X. So then I have an element there which defines me a correspondence between shifts on X and shifts on M. Mm -hmm. And what you, you take probably just churn classes. Okay. Yeah, no. yeah, roughly that, that's it. Can I, can I just try to understand this descendant algebra? That uh, here you mentioned this is a super uh, commutative, I assume it's a graded algebra. So, how is the chain class? What is the degree? And also with the cohomology degree of gamma. Uh, Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the. You, the you said the super, super commutative C, C algebra. So you, ah, you, you mean the, the super? That's right. You must ah, have yeah, yeah. Some, so, some sort of uh, some degree, but here you have the Chern i and also the gamma also has a cohomological degrees as well. So yeah, uh, it's it's just a degree of gamma. So the, the z mod two degree mm -hmm. uh, in so you have a z mod two degree on, on the cohomology of, of x and that induces a z mod two degree on, on the x. 
So the eye doesn't have anything to do with it. Yeah, yeah, the eye doesn't beauty. matter. Uh, okay. Morally, because the, the eye, you see, the eye, eye appears here. It's some, it's a, it's a churn character, and mm -hmm. so it, it always has even, uh, even dimension, it's even, uh, okay. even degree. Okay, good. good. So it's it's just the, the the degree of x. So in particular, if x only has even cohomology, this is, then this is a commutative, a free commutative algebra. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the especially the Rn, uh, try to look at and understand what the Rn is. It looks like uh, more of a universal derivation that um, so, uh, you, here? you take the, yeah, you, you take the Rn, you take the nth derivative on the top of the Ci that go all the way up to Ci plus one. So some kind of a jet scheme version of uh, derivation. Am I, did I understand that relation correctly? For the R and the right um, derivation property. Oh, so uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Sorry. Yeah, I try to understand what this R and and you have this action. So um, this is a this is a, a free algebra on this symbol. So if I mm -hmm. want to define the derivation, I can uh, define yeah, it on yeah, generators and then extend. I try to understand. I try to understand the the intuition of this R and. The yeah. T is uh, easy to understand. That's the co multiplication um, and joint representation. So I can understand the T, but the R. I, I guess so I, I think fr from these formulas, it's not so uh, easy to give uh, some satisfactory justification. But yeah, so I, I, after the talk, I will tell you what this R stands for. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a more but of a universal true. differential algebra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh -huh. but but the upshot of this talk is that, roughly speaking, these uh, these operators, uh, these Verzor operators, will be the operators induced by by uh, a conformal element on a, a vertex algebra, which, roughly speaking, looks is very close to a lattice vertex algebra. It's not exactly, but but almost. But yeah, I mean, maybe from I don't know from these formulas, maybe this is. Not it's not so easy to see exactly how, but yeah, yeah, that that will be the the upshot. Okay, thank you. Okay. So yeah, as I said, this satisfies the various or brackets, and so they define the representation of half of the various or the algebra. Um, and something that I'll just mention mention quickly there, there is also a, a ver you, you can also set up things so that it's natural to also study moduli spaces of, of pairs with this language so you can take um, this tenant algebra which will basically be dx tensor with dx so it will be generated by symbols of two kinds chiv and chif um, and, and basically, because when you have a universal pair, you have two universal shifts, and so you you can realize the first universal shift, and then this is this is the symbol you you use, or you can realize the second universal shift. And also, there is uh, there are uh, pair versus or operators acting on this algebra, uh, which are are very similar, but uh, and and the difference is basically related to the difference between the the deformation theory of sheaves and deformation theory of pairs. So here you see that I'm putting here uh, CHIF minus V, which is just a shorthand notation for CHI of F minus CHI of V uh, times CHF. And roughly speaking, that's because the deformation theory of uh, pairs is something like R on between V to F and F. Okay, so let me start by by now stating the the conjectures in their sort of um, general form, and I will actually start by by pairs, although this may sound strange, because pairs are easier to formulate because we don't have this issue of not having a, a unique universal shift. And so the conjecture for pairs is, is the following: so for a moduli space of of pairs with a universal pair uh, like this. If I take any element in the in the pair descendant algebra and I apply this operator ln pair, uh, 
Um, then I take its geometric realization with respect to the universal pair. So that, that gives me a, a cohomology class on uh, a cohomology class on the moduli space. And then I integrate against the virtual fundamental class. This is always zero. For every D that I that I start with and for every N that I start with, I apply the operator, I take the geometric realization, I integrate this, and then this is zero. And here it's just a quick explanation of what the pair geometric realization is. So we have these two kinds of symbols, and these ones are realized using the shift Q, uh, pullback of V, and this one is realized using the shift F. Okay. Uh, can can it be written down similarly to Witten's story, like ln applied to some um, generating function, which is probably integral of something over which virtual fundamental class is equal to zero? It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it can be, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's... basically, I consider generating function of uh, these enumerative invariants for pairs, I apply ln with n greater or equal than n minus one, and it's equal to zero. So that's the way to write it down. Yeah. Yeah. So in in, in some sense, uh, the writing the relations like this is uh, looking at some particular coefficient of of that uh, of the equation that you get from from the differential equation so cho choosing a d roughly speaking is like choosing a coefficient mm. okay okay so what what about shifts then so for for moduli of shifts we have this ambiguity in the choice of universal universal shift um and so i i, I don't want to to write something uh like this for shifts and say for any universal shift because, um, so instead the correct thing to do is, is to just look at relations among uh, descendants that actually do not depend on the choice of G so if I have universal universal shift G then I can get another universal sh shift G prime by tensoring with a line bundle pulled back from M and the two geometric realizations it's this is a very easy computation are related by by, by this formula where this r minus one is exactly the uh, one of the one of the derivation one of the derivations that I defined before. This r minus one plays a, a kind of a special role. Um, so what you see here is that if r minus one of d is zero, then the geometric realization with respect to g prime is equal to the geometric realization with respect to g. So, so it makes sense. Yeah. No, 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 sorry. Uh, so in, in the future, you will have a bigger structure of vertex algebra. Does it the right hand side correspond to some vertex operator applied to CG? Something like that. Um, so it looks like exponent of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this R minus one uh, will correspond to the translation operator on the vertex algebra. Okay. So this is like the exponent of, uh, so in, it's very common that you see some expression like e to the z t, where t is the translation operator. Yeah, but I, I see them uh, uh, often when I consider vertex operators. That's why I'm asking, yeah. Like expression exponent of some linear combination of something including the derivatives it's kind of it looks like a vertex operator but any, anyway yeah if you haven't thought just go on but i i think this this is even simpler this, this, is, this is an expression that appears in every vertex algebra um, but yeah anyway yeah so basically this r minus one you should think that this is a the translation operator. More more precisely, this will be dual to the translation operator on on the vertex algebra. So, mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, does the t negative one? Because l negative one equals r negative one plus t negative one. So does does t negative is t negative one just a zero or? Yes, yes, yes. That's right. Yes. 
T negative one is zero. So R minus one is the same R, as L, R L minus one. Is exactly the L negative one. That's that's the operator in the vertex algebra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So we say that some element in this descendant algebra has weight zero if it is annihilated by, by R minus one. Um, and we denote by dx weight zero, the algebra of weight zero descendants. And the point is that if we have some guy here, then the geometric realization does not depend on the choice of G. Basically, because if you apply both sides to, to D, uh, only the term with J equals zero will survive. And in particular, it makes sense to write integral of D against the virtual fundamental class to mean the integral of the geometric realization of D with respect to uh, any universal shift, because this will not depend on the universal shift we choose. OK. So now it turns out that the correct way to formulate um, various or constraints for shifts is to is to combine the operators, uh, the various or operators in a way that produce, always produces weight weight zero descendants. Um, and the definition is the following: we define L of weight zero as this uh, infinite sum over uh, over all n bigger or equal than minus one. And here we have the L n operator, and he. Here we have the R, R minus one, N plus one. Uh, and this is kind of an ad hoc definition, but it also has a very natural interpretation from the point of view of uh, of the vertex algebra. Although I think I will not I will not talk about that um, today, but but this does have a very natural interpretation um, on the vertex algebra side. Okay, and so the fact is that uh, the image of L weight zero is contained in the algebra of weight zero descent. So with this in mind, uh, we can now make uh, the conjecture of the first of, we take any D in, in the descendant algebra, we apply L weight zero, we get, we get a, a weight zero, uh, a weight zero descendant, and then we can integrate against the virtual fundamental class uh, by realizing using any choice of universal shift because that choice does not matter. And the conjecture is that this is always zero. For every D that we put here, we always get zero. So uh, I reckon this is kind of a maybe a slightly uh, abstract uh, way to formulate. So let me give you a very concrete example of how how those constraints actually look like on a very concrete moduli space. So let's take the moduli space of stable bundles um, on a curve C of genus G, uh, and let's take rank two, and let's take fixed determinants. So this is a very simple moduli space. It's smooth, projective of dimension three G minus three. And basically everything that you want uh, about this moduli space is known. Its cohomology, uh, its cohomology ring is, is known. Uh, all integrals of descendant classes can be computed in terms of uh, integrals of powers of these three special classes, uh, eta, theta, and zeta. And such integrals were computed by Tedius in, in the 90s, and they have this, this nice formula. So the integral of this guy is equal to some, uh, some combinatorial coefficient, which is not so complicated, times some Bernoulli number, which is the most interesting part of the formula. And this holds when the when the dimension constraints are right. So when m plus two k plus three p is three g minus three, and this q that appears here is given by by this. So then you can ask, what exactly do the Verzor constraints say about those integrals? And the answer uh, is, if if you work a bit, it turns out that the Verzor constraints for this moduli space are precisely equivalent to these kind of relations. So this is some proportionality result between eta m, theta k, zeta p, with the same thing when we replace m by m minus one, k by k minus one, and p by p plus one. And so, of course, this is implied by by the by these integrals that that is computed. Um, and actually, this is just seeing this this combinatorial coefficient. So, so roughly speaking, it's exactly seeing this combinatorial coefficient. Um, on the, however, it does not see the more, more interesting part of the formula, which are the, the Bernoulli numbers. So uh, this is 
kind of how I think about various or constraints that uh, usually they will not see the, the the very special features of some particular moduli space, but instead they they provide something that's true for all moduli all moduli spaces. So in some sense, it's basically impossible that they will say very interesting things about some particular moduli space. And from my point of view, like the, this combinatorial coefficient is the somehow the, the particular phenomenon for, for this moduli space. Okay. Do you have any, any questions? Okay, so so I um, explain how, in reasonably concrete terms, how <clears throat> these constraints look like and how the operators look like. And by the way, these operators were really found by by playing around and trying to uh, fit some numbers together. But now I want to explain that actually those operators that were kind of guessed. Uh, have this beautiful interpretation in terms of vertex algebras. And so let me just do a very quick recap on, on vertex algebras, mainly to, to set up notation. So a vertex algebra is, is a, a vector space, sometimes sometimes graded. So I'll, I'll put the bullet because implicitly I'll always have a grading. And they have a, a vacuum vector, which is some kind of unit. They have a translation operator, which is an operator from V to itself. And they have a state to field correspondence, which is the, the richer structure. So this is a this can be seen as a map from V to formal series with coefficients in endomorphisms of V, um, which usually is written like this. So you can, if you take some U in V, then Y U Z is a power series in endomorphisms of V. So it makes sense to apply it to another element of, of V. And you get uh, you get a power series uh, with coefficients in V. So an, uh, another way to pack the information is that we have uh, a Z fold of products U N V from from V tensor V to to V. And of course, these guys will satisfy some some complicated um, some complicated axioms, which will not really matter for for today. Okay. So vertex algebras sometimes produce uh, representations of the various or algebra. So very often it happens that a vertex algebra comes with a conformal element, and uh, this is uh, so this is some element in in the vertex algebra such that the induced operators ln defined by the n plus one multiplication by omega they satisfy. Um, they, they form a representation of, of the of the Virasoro algebra. And now it's of the full Virasoro algebra. So we have these operators for every integer n. And the bracket is like this. So ln lm is equal to n minus m times l m plus n. So that, that's the, the first, the, the, the same Virasoro bracket as we had before. But now we have an extra term with some constant here called a central charge. And before we were just considering representations of half of the various or algebra, so this term was was zero. So we were not seeing this term. When we when we have a conformal element, we really get a representation of the full thing. No, you also didn't have. Okay. Any... So another notion that uh... you, you didn't have negative. Sorry. Generators. You didn't have also negative generators. You don't, did not have L minus five, for example. You, you yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely so it's... yeah so th that's the point if if you just take m and n at bigger or equal than minus one then this guy will always be zero okay so another notion that that plays an important role is uh that of borchers lee algebra so if you have a a vertex algebra V, then there is a, a natural Lie algebra structure on the quotient of V by the image of the translation operator. And I will always use a check to, to denote Borchardt's Lie algebra associated to a vertex algebra V. 
And the, the bracket on this guy uh, is defining in a very simple way. So if you want to take the bracket of u and v, uh, of the class of u and the class of v, you you take some some you choose some lifts u and v, you take the zero product, and then you look at its class again in Borchardt's Lie algebra, and you can prove that this is well defined. So it does not depend on the choices of representatives, and you can prove that it satisfies the axioms of a of a Lie algebra. Okay, so the the most fundamental example of of uh, the, the simplest or maybe not quite the simplest, but uh, one of the simplest examples of vertex algebra is the lattice vertex algebra. So if you have some, some abelian group and the symmetric bilinear pair in Q, then you get a, a vertex algebra structure on, on this guy here. So usually people call this lattice vertex algebra when lambda is, is a, well, when lambda Q are, uh, it forms a lattice. So meaning that lambda is free and Q is non-degenerate. But more generally, you can always get a vertex algebra from an abelian group and any symmetric bilinear pairing. And when Q is non-degenerate, uh, you also get a conformal element. So if Q is, is degenerate, you, you get a vertex algebra, but not, uh, but not a conformal element. OK, so these are the kind of very, very basic uh, very basic vertex algebra theory I, I'll need. Um, OK, and what really plays a role is uh, the vertex algebra that Dominic Joyce defined. So let me also um, give a very brief overview of, uh, of his construction and uh, of what's the point of the construction. So, so we consider the the stack MX that parameterizes all the perfect complexes in X, so objects in the derived category. And what Joyce does is he defines a vertex algebra structure on the homology of this stack. And so- in Which homology? Borelma? Sorry? What, what kind of homology? In this? No, no. Uh, so no, not borel more. Uh, so you, you, if you have some, some stack, you can take some kind of, Topological realization of the stack, and it's really the the homology, the topological homology of, of the topological realization of the stack. So, mm -hmm. for instance, if you uh, if if the stack were uh, BC star, then this would be the the homology of CP infinity. So, it's kind of an important point that this is not Borelmer homology because. Um, I think the, the theory needs uh, non-proper push forwards, which borel more homology doesn't have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to define the vertex algebra structure here, uh, you need to define a translation operator, which I'm not going to write exactly, but roughly speaking, it's related to the BGM action on MX. So roughly speaking, that's this action is, uh, well, it's related to the fact that if you have a if you have a shift, uh, you always have a C star act uh, C star or, or GM if you prefer acting on the shift. So that gives you an action of BGM on the stack MX. Um, and roughly, and T is related to that. And the state of field correspondence is the most interesting part. And there is a completely explicit formula, which, again, it doesn't really the the precise form form doesn't really matter for the purpose of this talk, but just for completeness, I'm writing it here. And the key ingredient is this complex theta, uh, which is a complex in mx cross mx, and it's given by this. So over a point fg in mx cross mx, it looks like r om f fg dual plus r om of gf. OK. So what exactly is the point of, of yeah, just a second. Can you, can you go back to look at the uh, translation? Okay. I try to understand. So the BGM, the homology, the homology ring is the polynomial ring with one single variable. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how how in this case how do I understand the T, the translation operator? So what what the T does is, um, so 
you take, let's say you have some class in the homology of MX, some class mm -hmm. U, uh, let's call it U. Uh, you take U tensor, the generator of BGM on the homology of this guy. Mm -hmm. And then you push that forward to MX. Okay. So the BGM the homology of class in in degree, in degree two, right? Mm -hmm. It's the generator that, that that's what the polynomial algebra of uh, homology of uh, BG, BGM. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. right. So the T so is, is T is just the multiplication, the action of this T of this uh, generator in degree two. Uh, Am I right? Yeah, I mean, you 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 tensor it and then you push forward. It's not exactly multiplication. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yeah. The, the action is through tensor and the push forward. That's how the action is defined. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. That, that's right. Well, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So, <coughs> what is what is the point of even looking at this stack and its its homology? So the point is the following: if you have some moduli spaces of of sheaves, so let's say you want to to study uh, wall crossing on moduli spaces of sheaves. Um, and the kind of wall crossing you want to do is, is to see how the virtual fundamental classes change. So of course, this is, this is a problem because uh, you want to compare virtual fundamental classes, but they live in, in homologies of different spaces. So what you can do is, is uh, try to push forward those virtual fundamental classes to a common space, uh, namely this, this stack that parameterizes all the complexes. Um, and, and, and then, the, the homology of the, of this space will be a good uh, a good place where we can compare the virtual fundamental classes of different of different moduli spaces. And what will happen is that wall crossing formulas will precisely be written uh, in terms of the the, the bracket in bo the Borchardt's Lie algebra associated to this vertex algebra. So I'll explain. Uh, all of this in, in slightly more detail now. So if you if you have a, a moduli space of, of shifts and you have a choice of universal shift G, then by the universal property of the stack MX, you get the map from M to MX. And then you can you can look at the class M ver G, which is just defined as, as the, the push forward of M ver via this map. And again, here there is an ambiguity in the choice of, of G. Um, what you can do uh, is now go to the to the Borchers Lie algebra, to the quotient by the image of T. And when you do this, uh, you remove the dependence on G. So if you now define M ver to be the class of this guy here in the Borchers Lie algebra, now this guy does not depend on, on the choice of G. You eliminated that that dependence by by quotienting out, and one way to to see this is uh, using the fact that actually this quotient can be identified with the homology of the rigidification of the stack MX, and you always have a map from M to the rigidification of the stack uh, of the stack MX that does not depend on the choice of universal shift. So from a moduli space, you get uh, a class in the in Borchardt's Lie algebra. Okay, so uh, a different way, which is not the point of view that Joyce takes, but uh, it's maybe my preferred point of view uh, on this is to think uh, is it uses the, the the so the, the following following fact, which is non-trivial fact. So the cohomology of M X uh, is closely related to the algebra, the formal algebra of the sense that I was talking about. And the, the way, so they're not quite isomorphic, but for practical purposes, let's let's think they are. Uh, and the way they're related is the following. We, we have a universal shift on MX cross X. And so we get a, a morphism from DX uh, to the cohomology of, of MX by taking the geometric realization with respect to this universal shift. And, rough, and, and this, more, this geometric realization is basically an isomorphism. And similarly, we also have a relation between the cohomology of the rigidified stack and uh, 
the algebra of weight zero descendants. And so you can think about uh, an element in the vertex algebra, which is an element in the homology, uh, to, to give you information about how to integrate uh, an element in the formal algebra of descendants. Because uh, the, well, pairing a homology class, the cohomology class is basically exactly the same as uh, doing the integration of the geometric realization of D against the virtual fundamental class. And something similar for weight zero descent. So actually what I was saying before about descendants and the formal descendant algebra is pretty much uh, connected to, to this vertex algebra story. Okay, so, and as I said, the point is now to, to study wall crossing. So uh, the typical scenario in, when we're studying wall crossing is we have some moduli spaces M alpha, parenterizing shifts with say turn character equal to alpha that depend on some uh, stability parameter mu, some, some Okay, and we want to, to change mu, or in this case, how the um, how the enumerative invariants that that we that we're looking at change when we change mu. And Joyce's theory provides a, a an answer to this. So, well, before I said the wall crossing formula, a key ingredient in in the theory is that. Um, so what I was saying before. Always was was always assuming that stable was equal to semi semi stable. So, uh, and a key ingredient is that you can actually define some classes in Borchardt's Lie algebra, even when uh, the moduli space contains strictly semi stable shifts. Um, and of course, when it does not contain strictly semi stable shifts, then this class is just a class that I was explaining before, coming from the virtual fundamental class. And once we have uh, this, this, all these classes, we can now uh, state the, the general form of uh, uh, wall crossing formula. So if we have mu and tau, two stability conditions that are connected by a, by a one parameter family with a bunch of conditions that I, I'm omitting. So the, the, the theorems are much more complicated to state that I'm, that I'm doing here, but this is kind of a simplified version. But the upshot is that, uh, the, the, inv the enumerative invariants uh, for its stability mu can be written in terms of enumerative invariants for the stability tau uh, using the, the brackets in Borchardt's Lie algebra. So this is an equality in Borchardt's Lie algebra. Okay. So I, I now want to, to tell you how um, how to construct a conformal element that will give the Verrazzaro operators that I, I was talking about before. And unfortunately, we, at least for now, do not have uh, a direct geometric way to construct this conformal element. Instead, what we do is, uh, well, we know exactly what, what the, the vertex algebra uh, is in this case, thanks to a result by by Jacob Gross. So, uh, so Gross proved uh, well with some some contributions from from our paper that was uh, correcting some some parts of Gross paper. Um, but he proved that roughly speaking, V is uh, basically a lattice vertex algebra. It's not quite what people usually call a lattice vertex algebra, but uh, it has exactly the, the the same flavor, and it is a lattice vertex algebra. The the underlying vector space is, is this one. This is semi topological K theory, which is not so important what it is exactly, but this is maybe the more important part. There is the cohomology of X, and this comes from um, what does S S C S C U ah S S C U what is it? That's su supersymmetric free oh, algebra generated by this 
this module. In the category of graded vector spaces, there is no, you can take symmetric algebra or whatever. The one S is certainly can be removed because it's part of the. No, it's because. It, because it's super symmetric. It doesn't matter. You can do, you can do linear algebra is any in, in the category of graded vector spaces. So then, uh, well, yeah, there there are two different gradings. Uh, one is the super grading. The other one is a standard grading. No, so but uh, it can be. No, but you 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 are do you. It's my understanding that you are doing linear algebra in some category of. Graded, bi graded, three graded, whatever vector spaces. Yeah, it, it's a it's a it's a graded uh, symmetric monoidal category. So. Mm -hmm. Why it's I mean, well, it's but, it's it's braided, but it's like uh, category of super vector spaces. It's also braided, but that's with, that they have two different sim There is mm -hmm. there is another braiding which is just a standard one without the sign changes. So the S here could just uh, to Listen, this S. all was considered <laughs> in the Gilinian 80s. When, yeah. when he, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of way, sort of outdated to, to see that super vector space. And, and, and people in the derived world always just doesn't yeah. use the second S. But for other yeah. people, would say, okay, the second S emphasizing I'm using the super. Reading. Yeah, but uh, sorry, I mean, but... it's a bit outdated. You see, you should save some ink. For example, uh, people in this derived category, they write tensor product with L above or derived, put R for, for derived funds. So it's kind of, it goes away. Because, for example, if you talk to people who are in the business like Denise Gates Gori or Sasha Braverman, everything is derived mm -hmm. by definition. That's so right. the That's same right. story here when you just say in which category you consider what is in the bracket, this cohomology. Yeah. yeah. So the so anyway, of... so it's just symmetric symmetric algebra generated by the vector space. Graded. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right. But I was I wasn't clear about this K zero SST. Oh, is that some stable K theory? Yeah, so sorry. So this is the, uh, well some the K mm -hmm. some kind of K, K theoretical notion. It's semi topological K theory. But um, so yeah. so what I can say is that uh, so this is a, a, a billion group. But if you tensor it with uh, the complex numbers, at, at least in this case, that uh, so I'm here, I'm asking that the dimension is at most two, just because it, it's slightly easier to state in this mm -hmm. setting. Yeah. So in, in, in that case, if you tensor this with C, that will give you the... Uh, this is uh, a group I, algebra. Yeah, you're, you're tensing over there, that's the group algebra. A billion group algebra with a ah yeah yeah this is sorry this is the billion group of yeah mm -hmm. ah, so the sorry, theory I, is I the were... is the lattice structure there should be a symmetric lattice generated by linear form on the group that's what a lattice uh, mostly might want even lattice so the vectors the elements should have a uh, square being even so is is the inner you know, product obvious somewhere or yeah so the so you always have fr from this guy you always have mm -hmm. a a churn character map to the to the cohomology mm -hmm. and the symmetric bilinear form is this one i'm writing here so okay good yes th this is on this is on co on cohomology but um but but basically you, you use the churn character to to go to cohomology and then you you do this so th this is as i said this is not quite a lattice vertex algebra because what you have so in a lattice vertex algebra this guy would be exactly this one tensor c which mm -hmm. is not exactly the case here but this guy tensor c embeds here and mm -hmm. that this is still enough to construct a vertex algebra mm -hmm. it's it's an extension it's some kind of extension of a lattice but vertex algebra yeah I, yeah i guess so mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, as I was saying, this, this comes from this symmetric bilinear form. I know if you remember what I said a while ago, from a symmetric bilinear form, uh, you can always construct a vertex algebra, but not always a conformal element. You can only construct a conformal element when uh, this form is non-degenerate. Mm -hmm. And this, this will not be the case in general. For example, if you take a curve uh, with positive genus, this will be very degenerate. So what we do instead is look at a, a larger vertex algebra, which is kind of a pair version of, of this vertex algebra, which as a, as a vector space is just the, the tensor of V with V, but not as vertex algebra. So, the, so yeah. And uh, it, it arises also naturally from Joyce's construction, but apply to moduli spaces of pairs, which have a, a different obstruction theory. And so the complex theta, which is behind the state of field correspondence, you should change it accordingly to, to account for the deformation theory of pairs. Um, and <laughs> yes. Sorry, I was coughing, sorry. Ah, sorry, sorry. No. Um, okay, and in, in this vertex algebra, something similar, it's still po possible to describe it uh, very explicit, explicitly in similar form to this, but now the problem is, is solved, that the, the symmetric bilinear form that you get uh, is always non-degenerate. And so with, with this, we can construct the, the conformal elements. And so the, the theorem is the following. So let's take x to be a point, a curve, or a surface with PG equals zero or H zero. So the, the Hodge number zero to equals zero. Then uh, there is a conformal element uh, in, in the pair vertex algebra. And moreover, this uh, conformal element gives exactly the Verzor operators in the following sense. So I, I explained it. Uh, the, the vertex algebra was basically homology of the stack, and the algebra of the sentence is basically cohomology of the stack. And so they are dual. And the Virozoro uh, operators defined on the vertex algebra are dual to the Virozoro, to the pair Virozoro operators defined on this algebra, this algebra, descendant algebra of four pairs. Um, okay. I'm not going to say exactly a lot about the construction, but one thing I want to emphasize is that you remember that there was this rule that was played by, by the, the Hodge degrees. Um, and somehow you have to input that in, in, in some way uh, in the construction of the conformal element. And the, the way we input it in, in this setting, so note that in this setting, last p minus q is at most one. Yeah. Um, and yeah, using, uh, and in this in this condition, um, well, to, to, to choose omega, as I said, we, we need to input in some place the, the Hodge decomposition. And yeah, this, this is related to, to kind of a, a standard procedure in, in vertex algebras. If you, if you have a fermionic vertex algebra, uh, you kind of need to bosonize the, the, the vertex algebra. And this, roughly speaking, corresponds to choosing some isotropic decomposition of the fermionic part. So in, in this setting, the fermionic part will be the odd cohomology of X. And the isotropic decomposition that we choose is this one. So the odd cohomology decomposes into classes of Hodge type P, P plus one, and classes of Hodge type P plus one P. And th that, that's the way that you, you input the Hodge degrees in, in omega. Okay. And with this, there is a extremely natural formulation of uh, Virozoro constraint. So in vertex algebra theory, there are these subspaces of physical states, which, which are basically, uh, Elements that are annihilated by 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 the Virzor operators induced by the conformal element, and 
from the duality that I explained before, it's it becomes very easy to show the following, to show that a moduli space of shift satisfies the shift versus or constraints if and only if this class is a physical state in Borchardt's Lie algebra. And the moduli space of pairs um, satisfies the pair versus or constraints if this is a, a physical state in, uh, in the vertex algebra. And this difference, while one is a Lie algebra, the other is a vertex algebra because of the existence or not of um, of universal object. Okay, and this is not only a, a nice formulation, but it has an extremely important co consequence, which is we can prove wall crossing compatibility. So remember that wall crossing formulas in uh, in the Lie algebra are always written in terms of of a bracket, uh, and this subspaces of physical states is closed under a bracket, so it forms a, a, a Lie subalgebra. So if you have two moduli spaces that satisfy various order constraints, then their bracket also satisfies various order constraints. And you also have something similar for pairs. If you have a moduli of shifts satisfying various order constraints and the moduli of pairs satisfying various order constraints, then their bracket also satisfies the pair various order constraints. So you, you should think about this, this proposition as kind of a compatibility between various order constraints and, uh, and, and wall crossing. And we, we have used this compatibility to prove uh, the constraints in, in the following, following moduli space. So moduli space of stable bundles on curves, um, moduli spaces of uh, stable sheaves on, on surfaces, either um, torsion-free sheaves or one-dimensional sheaves. But, uh, well, in, in the case of one-dimensional sheaves, there is some... Um, there is some technical condition that is necessary for the proof to work, which we have not verified, but uh, have a proof up, up to that. So, I, I, I well, Lino told me this was kind of flexible, but I, I think I'm already quite over time. So I think maybe maybe I will stop here and uh, yeah, maybe not say some not say anything about about the proof. So uh, yeah, I'll I'll finish here. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and in any case, your paper is in the archive. Those who are interested in, in details can be uh, can look at it. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, I do have a question. Uh, let's go back to this uh, versatile element existence that uh, mm -hmm. in general the pairing defines uh, that's not not it's not uh, not degenerates. So somehow you ex expand it, uh, the make it not degenerate. So here, how how do you formulate this um, versatile element if you have a even uh, degree and other degree in cohomology classes? Because the classical lattice view is everything is even in a even degree. You just pick up any basis and and a dual basis, and then you form the standard. Uh, Versor yeah, element. that's right. So but in this case, you have both even and other degrees. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with the other degrees? So th this this is well, this part is kind of concerning that. But uh, so the answer is, so you have so this what I'm calling here a generalized lattice vertex algebra. Um, mm -hmm. in, in this case, is uh, I don't know if exactly, but well, it's very close to the tensor product of a, a honest lattice vertex algebra and the fermionic vertex algebra. And the, the fermionic part is exactly the part that has uh, the the, the, that comes from the odd degrees. So mm -hmm. basically, you need uh, you need the conformal element in the lattice vertex algebra, I which, so the which conformal element you have, is just the, the unit degree parts, right? No, no, you, you also have something coming from the odd degree odd part. Degree. So yes, that's what I expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in a vertex in a the vertex algebra of fermions, uh, you also have a construction of a of a conformal element. And this construction depends on choosing some this some isotropic decomposition. And what we do is exactly consider this particular isotropic decomposition. 
that's what gives you uh, the conformal element in the fermionic part. Does it make sense? Yes. So in this case, all these L's would be L's could have odd degree as an operator. Am I right? Or they are always even degree, as I indicated earlier. No, the, the, the operators always have even degree. Mm -hmm. But they, they might have some uh, some odd classes in there, but uh, they will kind of always come in pairs. So you in the end, you always get even degree. That's, that's, that's right. That's right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, other questions? Actually, I have um, a few questions. So uh, I'm kind of uh, um, a bit confused that uh, you um, you concentrate on on Verasora const constraints only. Why Verasora? Uh, there can be um, you impose some conditions. I I, I cannot kind of judge. Uh, um, uh, how um, necessary uh, uh, to impose these conditions on on your on on your geometry, but in general, um, uh, this uh, partition function, like generating functions for intersection numbers, they can satisfy uh, more than just Verasora. Uh, mm, mm, mm constraints so i'm kind of with, with all this with all your technicalities i kind of uh, uh, lost why uh, verasora why just verasora i'm not religious about verasora because there are many other w algebras for example verasora is just the simplest one all right and generating function for uh, uh, stable framed shifts, they satisfy uh, uh, constraints in, for higher ranks, uh, which are W constraints, which mean they they uh, um, they are related not uh, to the cut uh, smoothly algebra SL two head, but some SLN head, whatever. So then why Verasora? I mean, I, I, I always kind of confused. Mm. Why, 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 why Verasora not, not more complicated? Is it some nature of the problem or <coughs> because you, you wanted to generalize just this part of Witten's conjecture? Um, yeah, I, I think I, I don't I don't have a satisfactory answer to that. So, uh, I mean, th this constraint, well, they appeared in, yeah, ca kind of natural way. Uh, I don't know. I, I, it's not impossible at all that these are just, uh, this is just uh, like the first step, and there are some more. Um, more general constraints like a kind of W algebra constraint, but I, I really cannot say anything about about that. And, and also, uh, uh, you wrote those formulas. I mean, do I understand your logic uh, correctly that uh, you do have kind of a categories of shifts and moduli, something which people studied like, I don't know, 60s, 70s, some classical things. But you embed them in something which is of derived nature, like moduli of perfect complexes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. your uh, algebraic structure, they are of derived nature. So you construct uh, mm, this actually latest algebra looking for cohomology of this moduli space of perfect complexes. So your algebra uh, comes from uh, not from algebraic geometry, I would say, but from derived algebraic geometry. This uh, mm, uh, vertex algebra and associated Borchardt-Sley algebra, it, it is defined in terms of the moduli spaces of perfect complexes, yeah? Do you understand correctly or not? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, good. So then it's natural, of course, to replace, um, uh, uh, to forget about geometry and consider just um, the nice category uh, with uh, um, some nice algebra geometric properties of the stack of objects. And, uh, um, well, and, and do this formal things, whatever, vertex algebra and uh, corresponding cut smoothie or borchards, call it the way you like, mm, uh, 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 and do it in this generality, right? So not necessarily uh, remembering that uh, there is, uh, well, if you do have some variety and derived category of coherence shifts or just the category of coherence shifts and the modular space blah 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 then you can try to to map it to this uh, universal whatever modular space as you did but your uh, uh, algebraic part including vertex algebras uh, 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 it's it's pretty abstract it looks pretty abstract it's not necessarily um, bounded by uh, by some varieties so i don't know by what do i understand correctly that it's possible to attempt to generalize um, this um, um, algebraic part of the story abstract from uh, from moduli of um, perfect complexes to moduli of um, objects, some nice, well, with some restrictions, but anyway, for more general categories. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think, yeah, typically the last right part of the story is possible yeah. to. Uh, 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 all right. Then, if this is uh, true, then um, you see. Um, if your category uh, mm, uh, can be enhanced to uh, even not to DG, but to a infinity category as often happens, then there is, uh, mm, there is a potential on the stack of objects, which for Kalabi Yaos, essentially it's, it, 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 well, it is, mm, mm, it value, it takes values in in numbers, but for non Calabiao, it's kind of it's not necessarily numbers. It's some sort of more general, like differential forms, if you'd like. So anyway, there is this potential, and so you you can uh, try, and people try. I think Joyce himself tried. Uh, to define the cohomology of your stack with coefficients in this sheaf of vanishing cycles. What you explained, it seems to be kind of a, a very restricted part uh, of that story that you forget about non-trivial uh, um, constructible sheaf on your stack of objects and just consider the trivial one and take the cohomology of your modular space. And as a result, you have very primitive uh, vertex algebra, which is essentially just lattice algebra. But if you add this potential to the story, it's not easy, but it's I think it's possible to do. Then you get uh, mm, more, you can get more complicated vertex operator algebras, kind of more general probably constraints. Uh, mm. uh, it, it's rather not probably not a question but <laughs> but a remark but 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 I believe that this structure is missing uh, in all this joyous business. Uh, certainly in the case of Kalabiyao categories uh, uh, mm, uh, the science is much much more advanced. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there is mm, uh, probably there is this uh, BPS uh, Lie algebra uh, defined by Ben Davison, which probably your vertex algebra 
uh, I mean, the corresponding vertex algebra, BPS vertex algebra, whatever it is, it can be constructed from the Lie algebra by some um, pure algebraic way. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of, it's a bit strange. Uh, mm, Mm. because uh, you have this uh, vertex algebras and basically uh, kind of uh, uh, the result uh, I, I can think that before your work there were some Virasora constraints all right and then you explain that these Virasora operators they they come from some algebraic structure but this algebraic structure it's not the end of the line i mean that you you can yeah uh, yeah so i think uh, i i think you're absolutely right that uh well the, this is all in some sense very primitive in 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 the sense that this basically corresponds to looking at uh, for example if you make the analogy with dt of calabia tree then this is like just looking at numbers, really. Um, and there's this whole story like of categorifying in different directions uh, or refining in different directions, DT of Calabia trees. And none of this is, I'm not doing any of that here. So the, if I were to establish an analogy with DT tree, I'm just looking at numbers, really. So, yeah, I, I I agree. This is somehow very primitive. Yeah, but yeah, but even when when you look at numbers, all right. So then, this whole crossing business is essentially kind of it's a very simple identities in uh, in the motivic whole algebra, uh, and until you start to ask what happens with virtual fundamental classes of some algebra geometric objects it's it's all pretty formal and sort of an easy to do so the non-trivial part is when you indeed take your moduli space take its virtual fundamental class so kind of very very but but at the level of enumerative invariance you really don't need probably uh, 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 you don't really need uh, to um, uh, to have this virtual fundamental class, there are kind of uh, many other ways to speak about enumerative invariant, at least in the, uh, in the DT story. The Grom of Witten, it seems to be, uh, um, I mean, it seems to be, uh, uh, <laughs> at, at this uh, at, at least as far as I understand it's just a coincidence because you can relate really what you count you count shifts so all the story is about counting of uh, semi-stable shifts mm, and uh, whatever it is related to Grom of Witten or not related it's a separate business which uh, MNOP and other people try to 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 develop so i'm not sure that if you deal directly with grom of witten you can see any of these vertex algebras yeah uh, at least currently no currently it's not uh yeah, Actually, this, yeah. i agree this this vertex algebra this is all uh shifty uh and it's kind of a coincidence that the MNOP makes the connection between this story and the story that was previously known in Grom Witten theory. But uh, yeah. actually, uh, in this Grom of Witten story, there is at least one uh, um, uh, theory which um, which uh, makes Virasora constraints and maybe w, even W constraints natural. It's topological recursion. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, it works for non-compact, only in non-compact case, but at least, uh, for example, Witten conjecture uh, and some of its generalizations to uh, local Calabi-Yau three-folds, uh, they, 
they can be explained from this topological recursion of ANR. Mm. Uh, so then I don't know whether there is a, a vertex algebra there. We, we, we defined with Maxim some, so we called it a structure, which uh, leads to uh, Virasora constraints in, in Gromov-Witten theory and in general in topological recursion, but, um, but it's non-compact. Uh, for for compact varieties, uh, the whole thing doesn't work. So then, indeed, it's a bit, yeah, it looks as a different story, especially since you said that this M and OP correspondence, it intertwines uh, both actions, which is interesting because it's it's rather ad hoc. There is absolutely no reason for MNOP correspondence from kind of more general perspective. It just a very special DT invariants, ideal shifts. If you uh, you can generalize them to to, to other uh, categories of shifts, and it will be this DT story and upgrades, but on the Gromov, but they are not related to Gromov written in any way. Yeah. It's a bit strange. Mm, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, 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 mm, mm, more questions? Well, if there are no questions, so thanks for the very interesting talk. Thank you. And this is it for today. <laughs>